We're very lucky here today to have two amazing writers. So it was an absolute privilege to be able to edit the Best Australian Science Writing Anthology. And we have two of the contributors here today. So we have the lovely Helen. So Helen has reported from Lebanon, South Africa and Australia and the Federated States of Micronesia for the New Yorker and New York Times and The Guardian. And she's a journalist on The Guardian's foreign desk. And she writes this incredible column, I'd highly encourage all of you guys to check it out, um, about insects and animals called The Nature Of. And also that she was a runner-up for the 2023 Bragg Prize for Science Writing. And she's currently writing a book called Freak of Nature for Scribner Australia. So um, we also have the amazing Jane McCready. So Jane McCready is an award-winning writer and journalist and author of Making Girls and Boys Inside the Science of Sex and a former editor of the Best Australian Science Writing. She's actually the founder of the anthology as well. And she's, was, she's the director of the Quantum Words Festival of Writing about science and was um, CEO of Writing New South Wales as well. So one of the best things about being moderator about this anthology is that when I was editing the anthology, I got to read a lot of amazing pieces of writing, but one of the questions that was in my mind constantly was, what's the story behind this? I wanted to know everything behind the scenes, behind every article. And today I have the perfect excuse, <laughs> perfect reason to ask these um, Jane and Helen. So Helen's article was about this amazing tale about this group of scientists who risked their lives to save um, seeds from a seed bank in the middle of the Syrian war. And also Jane wrote this incredibly thoughtful piece about the origins of immunization and about and kind of rewriting or challenging our understanding of it. So I've wanted to ask you this question for about a year now, Jane, <laughs> when I was editing this. Tell me a bit about the article and also how you came across it and the writing process. Thank you, Ivy. Um, I guess it, in a way I wrote this article in a day, but in a way it took me 20 years because it, the origins of it were probably in... I wrote a book for CSL, the once government-owned pharmaceutical manufacturer, that was about... It was about the history of fighting infectious disease weaving in the story of CSL. So it was about CSL first making antibiotics in Australia, about the development of immunisation in Australia, but, but weaving in the stories of scientific discovery around that. And so it had a little vid a cameo in it about Jenner, Edward Jenner, mm. who is often called the father of immunisation um, for his smallpox uh, vaccine that he developed in the UK based on the cowpox disease. Um, and CSL had at the heart of its campus a building called the Janarian Building that was named after Jenner, uh, and he was venerated as this hero. So I wrote this book, didn't question any of that. Um, a few years later, I came across a story of, of a, a fabulous English eccentric woman called Lady Mary Watley Montague, whose husband was ambassador to Turkey in the 18th century. And she travelled with him and wrote a book called Turkish Embassy Letters, in which she includes her witty, interesting, um, quite nuanced um, views about Turkish life and her observations of Turkish life. And in it she recounts, among other things, the story of Turkish grandmothers who scrape the skin of children and insert a little bit of smallpox material into the children, under the children's skin as a way of protecting them from smallpox. And Lady Mary Watley Montague said that she decided that she would bring this back to England um, after first putting her own young son through it in Turkey. So this made me think, oh, hang on, so Jenna's getting the credit, but actually before Jenna, there's this English woman who's doing this. And so, you know, as a true feminist, I thought, so a woman really did it. And then many years later, <laughs> I read something that made me think, hang on, it wasn't, she didn't do it, it was the Turkish grandmothers who did it, right? Um, the Turkish grandmothers had developed this scientific technique for fighting disease 
And so then I started looking into the history of immunization elsewhere, and there's a, there's a pastor in Boston with a fabulous biblical name that I've forgotten, Obadiah or something, something like that, who, um, who's often credited as bringing immunization to the Americas. But it turns out it was his African slave who told him about what they did in West Africa. And he actually had taken those techniques from his African slave. So I started writing a piece about where knowledge really comes from mm. and who gets the credit for it and who gets acknowledged. Yeah. So that was, it was a really standout piece, like when I was reviewing all the submissions. <laughs> and so it was another thing about how, I guess, a lot of sort of our preconceived notions or our kind of image, the very public image of science is really quite black and white and it's kind of very one-dimensional at some times. But one of the things is that I also wanted to kind of highlight in the anthology is that it's very much driven by humans and there's a very, it's also the humanity of science. And I think what really encapsulates is your piece, Helen. So tell, so I want to know, because it's such a, it's such a gripping piece about you kind of outlining and interviewing these scientists who in the middle of the war were trying to, you know, were risking their lives to protect a seed bank. So tell me about the importance of this seed bank and how you came across that story. Um, so I was living in Beirut at the time in Lebanon, which is, you know, Lebanon's a pretty tiny country. You can drive either direction in about two or three hours and then you get to the end of it and then you can't go any further because it's at war with both the countries next to it. Um, and I read that there was a seed bank about an hour away in the Bekaa Valley, and I didn't really know, I mean, I'd kind of heard of seed banks, and I knew vaguely what they were. I started reading a bit more about it, and I read that all the scientists working at the seed bank were Syrian, um, and I became curious about that. I read a little bit more, and then I came across this type of grass called Egalops Taushai, mm. which means, I think, type of goat grass. Egalops is the largest, the longest English word where all of the letters are in alphabetical order, which is a good, good weekend question <laughs> if any of you ever end up writing one. <laughs> um, and it was very, very golden. And it seemed like a bit of a kind of beacon and something you should go towards. Mm. Um, and so I got in touch with the seed bank and, and their main seed hunter. So his job had been for 30 years to go out hiking for a whole weekend or a week um, to the most remote place he could and, you know, snip off little pieces of... He was particularly looking for something called a wild relative, which is what Egalops Talshite is. So ever since we farmed, we've kind of selected, you know, we've selected the best of the crops and we've planted those and we've looked after them and pampered them and they're really soft and... You know, they're not hardy at all, but there are these wild relatives who've sprouted up on the edges and are a bit rough like some of our wild relatives might be. Um, and his job was to find those because those have survived without any human intervention. And one of the things that we face now is that a lot of our crops will have just one gene protecting them against various diseases mm. and kind of, you know, they could fail at any moment. Um, and, ver you know, diseases are moving to new places or higher up or pests are moving. And so this seemed important. But the most interesting thing to me, a lot of science articles are important. We know science is yeah. important. I think, you know, you're told all your life that there's a lot of money going into STEM and girls should be going into STEM. And STEM is really important, but personally, I like a good story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the story here really got to the bottom of, if you have scientists who are working on climate change all the time and are confronted with the facts every day and feel their own kind of special depression about what's going on. These scientists had given up an enormous amount in their personal lives at the same time as saving the seeds. So the seed bank was, in, um, was near Aleppo, about an hour away from Aleppo city. And when war broke out, it was captured by rebels and, and they had to move the seeds. So move, you know, jars and jars and jars of seeds preserved over many, many years and bread and the viruses had been removed very physical things that they had mm. to move, which had to be kept cold, or, or the herbarium, which was kind of, you know, like you press flowers, these are the, the, the grasses and so on pressed. And this one, the particular scientist who I spoke to, Ali Shehadeh, he'd stayed behind when most of his colleagues had left, mm. and he'd kind of driven every day 
to the seed bank and then started moving things and moving the herbarium and had to ask every hotel in Aleppo if he could use their fridge, but none of the fridges were big enough. So eventually he rented an apartment, hooked it up to a generator 24 hours a day and kept things cool in there. And in the meantime, his family was scattered around the world. Um, his, one of his sons stayed behind and eventually got out after a very close brush with death. And so these, these scientists were m moving all these things and saving these seeds, which really are helping the entire world. So if you think about, the, for me, the central metaphor of climate, or the, the sort of central injustice of climate change is that it's been caused by wealthy countries oh. and they'll suffer the, the least of the consequences. And the poor countries whose people did no, you know, very little to cause climate change are gonna suffer the most. Um, both because of accidents of geography and because of a lack of money to, mm. you know, adapt. Um, and these scientists have come from a very, very hot place, and their seeds are going to be used and bred to save crops in countries that are growing hotter and are generally quite wealthy, mm. but there wasn't, there's not really anyone to save the hottest places from getting even hotter because mm. we don't have anything to use. And so that's how I, why I got interested in the story. And there was a lot there. Yeah. Um, and so I would drive, I would kind of drive the hour and a half on these winding roads um, to get to Ali and we would spend days together. And he was very interested in language and language strangely became a really important part, mm. part of the piece as well. It must be incredibly difficult for like quite the journey for both of you to kind of encapsulate that sort of complexity into just words and also, depending on the editor, also a word count. <laughs> so I guess, what was it the most challenging part of writing this? So let's start with you, Jen. What was the most challenging part of writing this article? Oh, um, I, don't think, I don't think the actual writing of it was that mm. challenging, but I think probably what was challenging was realizing how many assumptions I'd internalized, yeah. you know, and going back to that thing of, you know, being taught that Jenna was the father of immunization, which is still what the World Health Organization's website says, you know, he's, he's still described in that way there. And I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve to be recognized either, mm. um, but tipping that on its head and saying, well, actually, where did this knowledge come from? Mm. Because that's not how we were taught not how I was taught to think mm. at school. So I think for me that was probably the challenge, mm. was changing my worldview. Yeah. yeah, to see something else, see it differently. Was it like that for you, Helen? Um, in this case, I think there were sort of two challenges. The one was describing, um, luckily at The New Yorker you go through a very, very long and rigorous fact-checking process, but describing the way that the very intricate manual seed breeding works in a way that was both accurate and interesting. Yeah. Um, and kind of speaking to these plant breeders and plant scientists and getting them to engage with me and answer my stupid questions. But the other thing was the personal stories, which were difficult for people to revisit. Yeah. Um, I ended up focusing the piece on kind of two, two of the scientists at the seed bank, but I remember there was one as I was speaking to him about, you know, trying to draw him out about what had been happening at the same time as they were packing up the seed bank. He just said it's like, he said it's like a bar of soap. The more I talk about the story, the smaller it gets, like the less I can remember. And he got really frustrated, you know, which you um, would because yeah. you don't want to revisit that time. So it was that. And Ali, um, in particular, sort of who ended up being the focus of the piece, he was really, I mean, it was just so difficult for him to talk about so much. And he, I think felt quite uncertain of his place in Lebanon. You know, there were, Lebanon took an enormous number of Syrian refugees, really above and beyond what they, I suppose, could have been expected to, but that caused a lot of tension, and I think it was difficult to be Syrian there, especially at that time, um, when the economic challenges in Lebanon were very difficult. And I remember when we first met, we were almost both these imposters, so we met at a cafe and we were wearing the exact same outfit. So we were both wearing pants like this and a white shirt, which was very much a kind of costume of someone trying to look professional and neat and like they belong there and they're not there to cause any trouble in there. You know, it, yeah. it felt a bit like that. We both kind of noticed that he was a very tidy man. His father was a couturier in Aleppo um, and so he cared a lot about clothes. Um, but yeah, asking him to tell the stories was difficult and it took him a really long time to trust me enough to tell him, to tell me what had happened to his son. Um, mm. And that, you know, kind of meant an enormous amount that he did. But it was, 
it was, yeah, doing those, you know, you, you, you're trying to make the scientists very vulnerable, I suppose, in a way by talking about their personal lives, which they're trying to protect, they're there in a professional yeah. capacity, and then you're having to be quite vulnerable because you have to sound stupid to get them to explain stuff to you in yeah. a way <laughs> that is going to allow you to tell yeah. non-scientists or, you know, non-seed yeah. collectors how this all works. Yeah. Well, you've touched on upon something really quite at the core of science writing, right? It's that intense balancing act of trying to communicate something so incredibly technical and trying to do justice to research, but needing to make it engaging, but and also so accurate, engaging, also not lose your audience, but still keep enough of the detail as well. Mm. And one of the things is that, so I completely, for me, with science writing, like it's, you come with me in with a preconceived notion of what you're going to write, or what you think you're going to write. And then when you're, write, when you're researching, and then it challenges your perspective as well. And what I really liked about both of your pieces is not only it tread that tr tightrope really well, but also it was about challenging people's perceptions about science as well. So I guess one of the things is that with science, is that, again, I was talking about how everyone believes that science is very clinical. Like, you know, what's the classic image, stock image, that everyone thinks of, of a scientist, like, person in a lab coat, <laughs> test tubes with really bright liquids inside. So how important it is to cover not just the research, but also include, like, human culture and also the humanity in writing? So what do you guys think? Because Often people think that with science writing, it's just like boom, 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 very clinical, like this is what we found, this is what's next. But what really makes people invested in science, what made me interested in science is the human face of it. What do you guys think? Yeah, Who I wants think to start? <laughs> it's, a, it's a human story. I mean, science, science is a human creation. It's a human artifact. Mm. Humans made it and humans continue to make it. And for me, that connection between science and culture is probably at the heart of everything mm. I write. And it's so obvious in Helen's amazing piece about the seed bank, too. I mean, I think, Jane, what I loved about your piece, <laughs> I'm just going to fangirl for a moment, um, <laughs> was just that it, you, it challenges you once. You know, it goes, oh, wait, this wasn't the father of immunization. And then it challenges you again. And then it tells you that actually, again, like, and you just kind of, in terms of getting rid of those assumptions, it really asks you to properly get rid of them. Um, the, in, in my case, I, so, I mean, so if you think of the typical person in the lab coat, I entered a lab, and in the back of the lab, I found Safa Kumari, who, when I walked into her office, said, I was wondering when a journalist would find me. <laughs> <laughs> I went like, oh, right, okay, this is... You sort of, if someone says like so, something like that, you tend to think it's going to be a bad interview, but she was incredible. As she talked, her voice just got louder and louder and louder. She was the first woman in her family. She was the only, kind of only one among all of her sisters to study, and she was much more educated than any of her brothers, and she was very proud of this fact. She was sitting there in a lab coat. Um, we were eating rose water biscuits. And, and then the way that culture intersected for me there, or, that became very clear, was one of the things that she was most afraid of losing was was her language, was the particular Arabic that her family spoke. Um, a lot of her family had resettled in Turkey and her nieces and nephews were now speaking Turkish. And when she'd gone to visit them recently, she'd, um, they'd, she'd been driving around and there'd been this pop song which she knew was originally an Arabic pop song. Oh. Um, and her nieces and nephews only knew the Turkish words and she, like, it was, sorry, they, yeah, yeah, so they kind of, the, I guess it was playing in Turkish, and she knew that this was originally an Arabic song, but they knew the Turkish words, and that really struck her. And then at the airport, she phoned her sister, and she said, how are we going to be able to speak to each other? In a generation, we won't be able to speak to each other, because you'll all be speaking Turkish. Our other, you know, I think they had somebody else who'd settled in France, and then she was still going to be speaking Arabic. And that, that really struck me in terms of her personal loss, you know, in addition to being far from her family, there was this very, very, very real thing which she faced losing mm. because she'd kind of chosen to stay with the organization to keep doing her research. She's a plant virologist, so she makes vaccines essentially for plants. You make them in rabbits, amazingly, um, and it takes a year to produce a vial that's about yeah. that big. Um, it can, and that stops viruses from, when they distribute their seeds around the world, it stops the viruses from kind of hitching a ride and then now being introduced to a new mm. country. 
but yeah, for me, that was, that's when I, that's when I felt like I'd kind of found the, the story, story, yeah. You talk about the rabbit and the antibodies just transported me back to six years ago. <laughs> they make, like um, buying antibodies, it's like, <laughs> real wild trip found down memory lane. It's, it's very expensive. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. So, that's the thing. So, I'm so happy you guys are here today because, again, like, listening about the backstory is so incredibly, like, fascinating as well. So, I think I, a lot of the people in the audience as well are also wondering, like, where, how did you guys, I, I just really want to know, how did you guys go upon the path of being a science writer or science journalist? Because from experience, a lot of people that I talk to who are science writers and science journalists, they come from very diverse paths. So like I'm a researcher by trade. There's a lot of science writers that are researchers by trade um, originally as well. So tell me about how you began, um, Jane. Um, well, I didn't do science at school after year nine. So <laughs> <laughs> Um, and for many years I would have said I wasn't interested in science, but I think I was kidding myself actually, because <laughs> when I thought, you know, I, was, I had all these folders where I, well, there was one about the periodic table, and there was another one about um, planetary probes, and you know, yeah. I, had, I had all these, this material I was collecting about various things. Um, and I think the, the not being interested in science was kind of a reaction against my dad, who was a scientist, who I was extremely close to, but I think I needed to separate myself from him. And the most shocking thing I could think of to do as a teenager was to drop science. So I did it. <laughs> 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 um, and instead did history at university, which I continue to love. And I've often written historical things about science as well. Um, and then about um, 15 or so years ago, for, you know, for things that were happening in my personal life, I had to get a job in a big hurry. And I had not been working as a journalist for a few years, decided I wanted to go back into journalism, send out all these applications to various places, and much to my astonishment and disappointment, <laughs> got offered a job on a magazine called Australian Doctor. <laughs> And thought, really? How, how has this happened? Um, but they'd offered me a job, I needed a job, so I took the job. And I adored it. I just completely loved this job. It, it ambushed me. Um, I, was, I was working with a group of science journalists and, and doctors, and it was a bit like doing a crash course in medicine without any of the practical stuff, so n can't give any advice. Um, but I just had to learn so much, so quickly. And it, I just became passionately interested in medicine and in the changes that were happening in medicine and the ethics around those changes, which led to me writing a column for the Medical Journal of Australia for over a decade and then becoming a science publisher and writing a science book and, yeah. 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 <laughs> Amazing. So... <laughs> I'm like, I was thinking about how I was, a, I was like, nerd by birth and still a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> it's like complete opposite. And one of the best things is that when you look at, when compiling the biographies of all the authors that got on the anthology, that's what struck me was the complete range of the type of outlets and also the type of, you learn about their background as well and how also that science writing isn't just like the typical, like when people think about like science writing, of course there's a lot of amazing outlets like Cosmos and ABC Science, etc. But I think science writing manifests in many different ways. It doesn't like, does, it's about the art of writing it, not so much the outlet as well. So yeah, so how about you Helen? How did you, tell me about your career. Um, I mean I think the reason I'm a science writer is because of these anthologies. Um, the reason I sort of was okay with calling myself a writer at all was probably because of them. I think that's one of the hardest steps. Sounds maybe a bit pathetic, but when you want to be a writer, it's obviously, it's often quite hard to acknowledge that, and it's certainly hard to acknowledge it out, out loud. Mm. Um, and there's something to be said for not doing that for a while. But the, I'd written this article, um, it's gonna maybe sound backward, but it, I'd, I'd started a literary magazine in South Africa, and 
through that had come into contact with an editor at the New Yorker who'd asked me to write for them. And I hadn't really written much before. Mm. Um, so I kind of, <laughs> it was a baptism of fire. And then I wrote this article about the Great Barrier Reef. I think I'm often searching for a kind of central metaphor with things which kind of help me or the reader to carry an enormous amount of information in, in something very small, mm. kind of like a Mary Poppins handbag. And um, uh, in this case, it was about uh, these experiments on something called mesocosms, which I so see you have a microcosm and then you have a, a, middle, a middle sized miniature w version of a world. Mm. And that was where they were doing these climate change experiments and it allowed you to kind of understand the scale of what was happening in the oceans. Anyway, and then that got into the anthology. And then when that got into the anthology, the editor who'd edited it tweeted it out and then that caught the eye of someone he used to work with at the New York Times in the science section and then I ended up writing for them. And that was really, I was a science writer only because you guys called me a science writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel bashful about, I mean, I do, I definitely love it, but you do kind of feel like a bit of a fraud if you don't. I certainly didn't, I mean, yeah, I did not study science at university, my God. Um, the, yeah, so. That here I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, once a, I don't want to derail you, Abby, but one thing I, I would say is that it's, I think it's a really wonderful thing that there are people from so many different yeah. mm. professional backgrounds writing about science exactly. because I think everybody brings different perspectives. Yeah. And it, I think, you know, the people like us <laughs> <laughs> who are frauds, um, <laughs> sometimes we might ask questions that you wouldn't ask if yeah. you had the formal training, so, you know? So yeah. I just think we really need the whole diverse community yeah. of science writers. And I think we, when we're not scientists or from a science background, we're also maybe better, a little bit, have a bit of a skill for finding what's actually interesting. Because <laughs> we're not just gonna nerd out about anything. You kind of go like, all right, how much can I get a reader to care about here? Well, how much do I care about? There's somewhere between yeah. those two things, we can get it. Yeah. I actually completely agree with you both. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is that a lot of, it comes up quite often when in discussions about science journalism and science writing, it's like, you know, I get asked quite often, it's like, do you need to do a science degree? Like, do, do you need to have been a researcher to be a good science writer? And often I ask, it's like, not necessarily. A lot of the best science writers or journalists I know did not study science. And to their, because that means they can have that sort of clear-eyed view into it and being like I said, like being to ask those questions that represents the audience's questions as well and like you guys were talking about frauds I feel like a bit of a fraud as well so um, I've a, I'm a virologist by trade I've only written one virus article <laughs> <laughs> which is the giant virus article and that was my very first article but the thing is, is that like um, but then I realized very quickly when I was writing is that being a virologist by trade like actually works against you like it's a double-edged sword because you get really buried in academia and also the technical language so my first sort of decent article was about chemistry and I nearly failed chemistry in uni and high school so again that was again like looking from the outside in right so yeah so that, I guess that kind of segues nicely into my next question about how I guess for anyone who wants to do science writing or is like curious about it, who wants to kind of communicate it. So what's any sort of like tips and tricks, I guess, the way you kind of approach it to make sure that it's um, kind of this technical science writing is like palpable for the, like palatable for the um, general audience? What do you guys think? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, I suppose for me that'd be uh, you know, one of the things you're told is that you should hide the, like with feed, feeding a kid, you kind of hide the vegetables with the, like you hide the <laughs> yeah. healthy stuff with the unhealthy <laughs> stuff, and that's finding a good story. Um, you got to ask scientists to explain things to you like you're a smart seven-year-old, and then that kind of helps you to explain it to readers. And then I think you just got to read the good science writers, and there are really good, like Annie Dillard is my favorite. Um, she writes these unbelievable Weird, but not, like, not weird like it's work, just weird like her brain is very big. <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of autobiographical science books. Mm. Uh, I think that looking out for the good, in my case, what keeps me going is the kind of challenge of, of again, finding those good metaphors. So 
Jenny Diskey is another writer who will often kind of put something very scientific into a very personal story. So she'll use like oh. Schrodinger's cat to explain how she didn't want to be raised by her parents anymore and is crossing a border in there. Anyway, the, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, I, I like to look for those and th those seem like really difficult things to pull off and then that kind of keeps me trying to find new ones. Mm. So how about you? Um, yeah, I, all of that, I think. Um, and I mean, also finding those human stories around the science is, is really important, I think, for getting people to be interested in it. Um, I would say, though, an, another thing for me is um, not being scared of the complexity, because often it, it's in the in the complexity. It's in you know sometimes as a journalist you've, you're interviewing a scientist, and you want them to give you something really simple, but it's rare for something really simple to actually represent the truth of yeah. of, of the science. And it can actually be in delving into it and exploring the contradictions and the nuance that it, it becomes most interesting. Mm. Um, so I, I really, I love to do that and I think you shouldn't be afraid of that. You shouldn't try to make it too simple. Mm. And it's when people do try to make it too simple that bad information gets out there, mm. which happens too often, right? Yeah. Mm. And I think the the best part about this kind of profession and being able to write sort of um, science articles is that it's the translation bit. It's, an, it's really fun trying to figure out, like thinking, it's like, oh, how can I make people, un how can I make myself understand and make other people understand as well? And ch chatting to researchers, because they're so incredibly passionate about their job, it is so much fun. And usually, but sometimes it takes about, it's usually the last five to 10 minutes when the best part comes out, though you're talking with them for about two hours and the ten, five to ten minutes, like write that down, write that down. Yeah, <laughs> when you go, is there anything else you wanted to say? And it's then like, they tell it you. It's like, it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Immediately drops a bombshell. And you've turned off your recorder and you're. Like, yeah, it's like, it's like sorry. It's like, <laughs> it's like no, but that's pretty much what I think every time. It's like, it's like, oh that. Talk about burying the lead there. <laughs> and they just drops like, oh yeah, I was the first person to, to discover X, Y, Z. Oh, and you're like, oh, do you have more time to have a chat? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. And then again, like, um, I guess the topic of this panel is about science culture clash and about how, I guess, how, again, the culture of science, our understanding of science, and why it's so wonderful to have you both here is because both of your articles kind of challenge sort of preconceived notions. So with your piece, Helen, it's about like, a lot of people when we think about art archives and museums, we think about, is, is this image of like, kind of um, past information kind of screwed away in a corner, right? And just being left there. But yours is about very much how it can offer like a path to the future of agriculture. And yours is like, challenging like I I was I still remember I like, trying to remember how to spell Jenna's name correctly so it's it's taught in every textbook and I still remember like um so how I learned English is like my parents like basically raided all the Salvation Army books and I still remember a picture book and it said like Edward Jenna like father of immunization it was like beautifully like oil painting back then picture books were all oil paintings I still have it I think it's in the basement somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, but that's the thing. So what are some topics, I guess, and a bit of a twisty question, like topics in science, I guess, that you see that's continually reported on that you kind of want to change the image of or you think should be challenged? So yeah, who wants well, the, to begin? <laughs> well, I mean, one thing, you know, I guess this is thematically connected to, to the piece that I have in the yeah. anthology. And... N not my story to tell, but the, we settler descendants in Australia have ignored a vast body of knowledge about this continent and this place that existed for thousands of years before we came here. And whether, you, whether First Nations people choose to use the word science to talk about that or not, yeah. it's an incredible amount of knowledge that is based on experience and experiment that could help all of us to protect this place. So that would be something I would think of. Yeah. 
How about you, Helen? Um, I mean, so I've just finished a manuscript for my current book, and I'm a bit dazed and staring, you know, straight at the sun now <laughs> after being let out of a cave for many, many months, after many, many months. Um, but th I think that the next thing I want to write, I want to try and do something where you're, like you said, Jane, like where you're kind of taking all the assumed knowledge and all the, the things you think you know, and you just try and push them away as much as possible and almost start with an entirely, try to develop an entirely new vocabulary for yourself. Mm. For me, I haven't decided whether to do it yet, but it might be, I was offered the chance to write this very long article about the clitoris like a year ago, and I did, and I kind of took the article for the, they, I took the assignment for the money, like I just had a baby and I was on mat leave, and she was only a month old, but it sort of thought like, oh, okay, it's 8,000 words, that's a pretty good word rate, I'll do it. Mm. And I was really skeptical because I was worried it was gonna fall back on all kinds of cliches that I felt we oh. lean on when we read about yeah, sex yeah. and when people write about yeah. sex, a very kind of, hey ladies, or like, you know, yeah. telling you like, it's not actually called this, or you know. I, I, just not weird enough. Mm -hmm. And then writing it, I learned so many things that I didn't know, and it always came back to, so the Australian woman who, just, who fully mapped the clitoris for the first time in the world, Helen O'Connell, did it because her textbook, she'd failed her exams a couple of times, I think, and she was dealing with the same textbook and getting really frustrated and then started noticing all the sexism in it and then started thinking about her own experiences with sex and how it just didn't quite gel. It didn't feel like it described things the right way. And that's really interested in me, interested me. And I think that if we kind of went, if you just went back to like thinking about how things actually feel f for you without anybody else's vocabulary and where they're happening and how they're happening, there might be something there in terms of like rebuilding an understanding of sex that doesn't lean on, that doesn't move forward from a kind of misogynistic and very Eurocentric history of, mm. of sexual experiences for women or people who identify as women um, and that it might be possible but again I've just handed in a manuscript so there are so many words all in my head and they're not <laughs> coming out necessarily in neat yeah. lines right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you touched on something that's really important I think this thing about science is that just because something is discovered doesn't mean it's static mm. as well yeah. it means that it's constantly evolving even scientific language even now in academia so academic language is like a language like a technical language onto itself. And I had to unlearn that like very quickly mm. um, when I st started doing like um, general science writing as well. And even now, like there's like researchers talking about how that language should be challenged and how we refer to species as well. Should, should we use a different way to refer to like Australian species? And I think that's the, also the fun bit because that means that each current body of knowledge is built on a separate one and so on and so on. And I guess like, um, is there any sort of topic that you think is just woefully underwritten about? So in terms of science that's going on, like right now, I'm like sure like COVID viruses is um, all very much dominating any sort of publication right now. Is there anything that you think is being overshadowed like that should be, people should talk more about? We were talking in, in the green room just before. I mean, this is, you can hardly say this is not talked about, but mm. about the way that COVID has overshadowed the enormous environmental challenges we face. Mm. Um, and how, you know, the, the catastrophic bushfires that we had in this country, because we went straight into COVID, I don't think we've quite reckoned with how devastating that was and what a, um, bringing the mood down, but what a harbinger of disaster that yeah. that summer was because we've had to deal with so much else since yeah. then. We've, we've, and I'm not, I mean, obviously there is a lot written about climate change and so I'm not really suggesting it's underwritten about, but I think, I think it has been a bit obscured you know, there, there was a feeling of more urgency maybe in 2019 than there is now because we've just had to deal with so much since and how much can we cope with, you know? Yeah. I think um, it was like barely six months, right, Be until oh, not the even. pandemic started. Yeah, yeah. and I think um, we as a country had never really got to or people had really got to reckon with the consequences of what has happened or what we should do to kind of mitigate it until we rolled into the next crisis. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. So, like, um, we, were t like we were talking, I'm going to borrow a phrase that was used in the previous panel, so hopeful, pes hopeful pessimism, I guess. It's, um, that's the thing you touched upon, what you just talked about, like a lot of the researchers, because it's so personal to them, a lot of like climate change researchers, or re like marine scientists, or any, most researchers that even intersect with ecology in some way. Like, um, there's a lot of articles talking about the despair and depression that they feel when they witness like their actual subject of their, um, of their research being decimated. And this hopelessness is like, they're just one cog in this wheel and they're mapping it, but no one's listening as well. So like, um, is there anything like, any sort of topics, Helen? <laughs> or like we were talking about, it's like, do you, do, do you think there's anything besides climate change or like? Or um, uh, I, the, the, look, one of the things that blew my mind recently was I saw this TikTok. I don't, I'm not on TikTok, I don't really watch it, but I came across this TikTok via Twitter, um, which was of a young man. I think he was about 19. He'd been in university for just a few months in the US and he was diagnosed with HIV, or he, got, he was HIV positive. And he was kind of just documenting his journey, but he'd been quite famous on TikTok until then, so doing lots of makeup tutorials and, you know, is absolutely gorgeous. And then just very bravely and quite matter-of-factly sort of said, I've been, you know, I, I'm HIV positive, I'm feeling this way. And then the next day, my, you know, he does one that is his mum taking him shopping at Zara to make him feel better, which to me was so relatable and strange at the same time, because I think growing up in South Africa, you know, HIV AIDS was this enormous, very, very oh, fast yeah. thing, and it's still very much happening, and we don't really read about that much. Yeah. And this seemed to me, I mean, his life, like he'll be, because, you know, because of the AR antiretrovirals and, and things that he can take, he, he'll be fine. Um, and so will a lot of South Africans, but uh, we don't really talk, we, I don't, we don't read that much writing about HIV AIDS anymore, I don't think. And there was recently kind of, you know, there were a lot of anniversaries of, of when it was at its height in the US, which kind of took a very different form to what it takes in South Africa, for example, where it's mainly defined, you know, it's sort of your, the, the, where poverty kind of defines mm. your, your likelihood of, of being HIV positive. And to me, I, I think that that's quite interesting. I think that it's evolved, you know, that, it's HIV AIDS has really, really evolved in the last few years, and we haven't written much about that. And it, I'm interested in how it's manifesting now and how it changes people's lives. You know, how it changes them less than it would have otherwise, but also an enormous amount. Yeah, and also a lot of the lessons from HIV. Yeah, I guess well, with the America, for example, distributing. Yeah. Well, there was this hope. I mean, it didn't quite bear out that way, but testing for COVID and distributing vac uh, vaccines and so on. You know, there was there was an infrastructure there when the country had had to develop a way to test people for HIV and go into very, very rural places and work out how to do it without people, it being very obvious who was infected and who mm. wasn't. So I think there's a story in Johnny Steinberg's book about it where, you know, there was a trailer and it was mobile and it was this great mobile clinic, but you went in and if you tested negative, you came out straight away. And if you tested positive, you had counselling. Oh. So everybody very quickly realised that the people who were coming oh. out quickly were negative and the people who were staying in for a long time were positive. Right. And those kind of lessons had all been learned and that, that helped when it came to COVID. Um, yeah. Not enough. And certainly poor South Africans, you know, we tested the, the vaccines, were tested on them before any of us took them. And yet South Africa was charged the same price as wealthy countries for vaccines, which still makes me really angry. Um, but, you know... There was other, there were, there were good things that had come out of it. Yeah. That did make me think of something, um, yeah. just listening to that. Um, when we write about infectious disease and when we, in the West, we write about diseases that are going to affect us. Mm. And we're not really that interested if, if those diseases aren't going to affect us. Mm. So one of the biggest killers in the world is malaria. Yeah. Mm. How often do we read about malaria? Pretty much never. Yeah. Because it's not here. Yeah. And... Also, that made me think about like tuberculosis as well. It's pretty much a forgotten disease in Australia, but it's very much an issue in Southeast Asia as well. So, yeah, so um, I have a, I feel like really strange saying this sentence. My colleagues have mentioned a few times, I have a soft spot for infectious diseases. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and I just, 
I guess the scientist never left me, I guess. Viruses are so weird and so interesting. So weird. They're not even classified. They're like neither living or yeah, dead. They're neither yeah, neither living nor they're dead. So freaky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, like there's such a contradiction. There's such, such a contradiction in themselves. Like viruses, you think about the tiniest thing, right? But there's certain viruses, like giant viruses, um, that are in the Arctic or found elsewhere that are larger than some microbes as well. Mm. And they're also parasitic in a way, but they just defy everything. And they look, they don't, they, their appearance defies our sort of knowledge. They don't look they, organic. They right? don't look, so they they look like, plus they're angular. If you look yeah. at an electron yeah. microscopy image of a virus, it's all complete angular. It looks like someone's drawn it or it's like a graphic design. Or especially. like a microchip or like it was made. Exactly. Yeah. So especially microphage, uh, microphage, like no, phages. Oh, can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> it's like, it's been a while. So <laughs> phages, if you look at it, it looks like a rocket ship. And it's like, it just looks fake, but it's not. And they're fascinating because they're kind of, um, they're kind of hijacked things. But anyways. So <laughs> we, we humans want to put things in categories. Yeah, you know? right? And that's yeah. what a lot of the scientific project is about, is yeah. clear classifications. And nature just keeps going, nah. It's like, <laughs> nah, <Psych>. we're going <laughs> to make a platypus. We're going to make a platypus. Yeah. yeah like, it. um, <laughs> it's incredible to see, actually. Like, um, you see, you know, the first sort of, animal like the kitten like the kingdom animal kingdom and the tree and it's all like this beautiful looking and you look at it now with genetics you're like oh that's complicated <laughs> it, it, it just looks like a mess and it just gets messier so yeah that's what's really quite interesting it kind of still keeps me kind of really excitedly reading every paper that comes out once in a while as well <laughs> so we still got a bit of time left but just to finish off I guess it's like which like um, just after us nerding about <laughs> infectious diseases and viruses. So like um, there's such a amazing diversity of articles and lengths, et cetera. So it's just a bit of a fun one. Was there anything in the anthology that really kind of grabbed you or like really, because the thing is that when I was reading all of the submissions, there were some that made me really laugh out loud, some made me cry. And so was there anything that kind of really left an impression for you guys? For me, I think the best opener of any of the articles was there's one about a, a hoss. Is it a virus? Yeah, the yeah. Other Bragg Prize runner up. Yeah, Olivia Willis's one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which opens just with these really gory details about a dead horse. But it's done very well, and you kind of, it's done very well in terms of scale, in terms of how big a horse is. Yeah. Um, and that I thought was so, yeah, just kind of dark and, and wonderful yeah. and, and I'm quite brave, yeah. Yeah. So that was the Hendra. It was um an article talking about the emergence of the Hendra virus in Queensland, and about how like basically that um before they knew it was the Hendra virus, it was this image of like of them lifting a dead horse and blood running down the street, and a, like just group of kids just riding their bikes through it. It's also it's kind of in suburbia, like a quiet, yeah, 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 you know, like yeah. this quiet small town where you imagine the streets are fairly empty except for the kids riding their bikes on a Saturday afternoon and it's hot and then there's just <laughs> a big dead horse in blood. It was like, that was really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember reading that. I just kind of had to sit for a bit and thinking about like, so if I, if I was a director in a movie, yeah, how would I, it was really quiet. And the thing is, is that it was written in very few words yeah. as well, like very short, sharp to the point, but mm. very evocative. So yeah, how about you, um, Jane? Uh, look, there is so much, um, and I, I have a great love for Alicia sometimes poetry, so that, that's one of the things that I really love in it. You did an amazing job, Ivy. Um, but I'm going to say something really, really nerdy, but I really liked Michelle Starr's piece about the null effect. I, I'm so happy you mentioned <laughs> it. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Um, and, I mean, she's, she's mainly writing about um, the importance of the null effect in a, astronomy. But it, it's also so important in medicine, um, this issue that... What is the null effect? So, <laughs> <laughs> the issue that, that papers that find no evidence of something tend not to get published. So there's a whole publication bias about this. Um, and 
the impact, you know, they don't get published because the journals want the big new exciting discovery, um, because the universities and research institutes want to support and fund and promote the big exciting new discovery. And nobody wants to say, hey, we did this study for five years and we found nothing. But <laughs> that's how science works stuff out, you know, yeah. is by, by finding nothing, by lots of people finding nothing. And the big issue you get in medicine with this is that the journals don't publish the articles where they find nothing, which has a number of impacts, one of which is that then other people go and do the same study because they don't realise that people have already done it and found nothing. But also, one of the most important ways that medical knowledge is transmitted and communicated is through the meta-analysis of research. And when the only studies you have published are the positive studies, all of your meta-analyses are just wrong and misleading. Yeah. And yet they're the things we rely on when, you know, this is this aggregation of multiple studies. And then by doing, by aggregate, aggregating multiple studies, you get a very large population size, which therefore leads people to say, this is so much more reliable because Instead of, you know, 300 people in the study, we've got 20,000 people across all these studies. But you're only publishing the ones that found the positive results. So it's... Mm. it's and it's the foundation of a lot of medical practice mm. is these meta-analyses. So I'm quite obsessed with it and I just loved reading that piece. Oh, thank you. But, yeah, like, um, the reason I chose that piece is because, again, it's about behind-the-scenes in science and about how... I remember when I started in science the first advice I got is, like, get ready to fail a lot. <laughs> so just get ready, get used to it. For one positive result, you get 50 negative results. And so it's about, I guess, science is very much not just finding what we know, or what we do, but also what we don't know. So, yeah. And I think this is a really nice end, in a way, to the panel. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Mary and Jane. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. And we do have 10 minutes for questions before we thank the authors and you get a chance to um, buy and have the lovely anthology. So who would like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the importance of the human aspect or the, and the personal story for good science writing, but I, I wanted to ask you about the role, is there a role for the imagination in science writing? I was interested in your emphasis on a, a central, finding a central metaphor, Helen. Would you like to start? Or um, I mean, uh, I think certainly. I mean, I think I'm only interested in writing a science story when it does suddenly it starts setting off all these other things and your imagination goes a bit nuts. And also when it, um, I was reading recently, strangely, <laughs> um, about a, this art critic nun and the nun was writing about what is the role of, of muses, of the muse. And she said that the muses sort of are there to kind of shine their light. Like the, the muse can only illuminate something if there's something there and what a muse illuminates is memory. And I think, I write this column for The Guardian um, that's like an extremely frivolous, and that's the point, column um, about, it sort of profiles a different animal or creature or, you know, last week's was the skeleton. And the way that I know that I've landed on one, and every two weeks when the column is due, I think there's not a single animal left in the entire world that I have not written about. I'm doomed. <laughs> and then you'll think, you'll come across an animal somewhere and then that's your imagination. Mm. Like something weird starts going on in your brain and something travels through it and starts like opening all these doors and there are things inside the doors and suddenly you've got like a compilation of just little words and ideas and memories and things you've read. And that, it's definitely, I'm really only interested in science when it does do that. And as you said, when you get into the complexity in there, like you find those little, yeah. yeah. So, and yes. <laughs> And it works with the compost of your own mind and all the yeah. stuff that's already in there. <laughs> the <and> compost. It... <laughs> <laughs> I'm using that next time. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. I think Helen hit the nail on the head. Like, um, if not without imagination, how can you make people read the articles, I guess? Well, the thing is that, like, um, I guess the imagination, it plays a huge role as well. Like, how the way I begin writing science articles is when you see a sliver of something. It could be... Completely, it could be a Twitter picture. It could be nothing. 
and makes me question, like, that's when it sparks the curiosity. It's just all these series of questions, like, okay, I'm a, like, I have license to answer all of these questions. I'm on a mission. So that's, like, um, and also it's about being able to convey it that, so it does grouse the imaginary. We just talked about Olivia's piece, right, that mm -hmm. we're talking about. Like, it really, like, pulls the readers in. Without that, I think it's very much doing a disservice to the audience as well. So, yeah. Yeah, one of my favourite pieces of science writing, it's maybe, maybe a little bit cliched, I don't know, but Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, I just, I can read that over and over, mm. and that's a work of imagination. Yeah. And also, like, um, especially when dealing with really abstract sort of, like, physics, and when I did the chemistry piece as well, because the bonds between molecules, you can't see it, right? um, how do you kind of bring that forth? and make it sort of, vis make the invisible visible in a way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question. Yes. Um, I'm curious about the term science, uh, yeah, and maybe I'm interpreting wrong, because it seems to frame it as separate from the humanity of people, but science is a process the pursuit of knowledge based on our understanding of the natural world and how it impacts our social world. So, like, what does science, because everybody thinks science is one, what does science mean to you? What is science writing for you? What, do, what are the boundaries of science? Because if you pursue any knowledge that affects people based on your understanding of the natural or social world to an outcome, that is science. I just would like to know because I bet three of us will have different interpretations of what science is. I don't, I don't really see boundaries. I, I mean, I, science is a creation of humans. It's a, it's a way of exploring and trying to understand. And I don't see that as profoundly different from other ways of trying to explore and understand. So for, for me, there aren't a lot of boundaries around it. Um, but I'm not a scientist, so maybe that's why. <laughs> Would you write about the composition of a piece of music because it is the pursuit of not like w because I wonder what people think science is because there's a lot of talk or mention that we want to make science stories human, but science stories are human. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm curious. I think it's sort of often defined and, and in, a, in a bad way in terms of a kind of dichotomy. So there's thinking and feeling mm. and there's logic and emotion. And, that, you know, that's, it is def I mean, it's a question worth asking because that is a, it's, it's a problem to look at things that way. But it's quite fun to play with the dichotomy when it exists. Um, certainly, you know, my column is completely unscientific. Um, I mean, it's, you know, like the facts that are there are facts. But it's really about how, why on earth do I care? I mean, one of the things I like to do is write about like a, like a gross animal, like something like nice. a Komodo dragon, <laughs> which is just like, it's got saliva coming out everywhere. There's dust on the saliva. It's wrestling its partner to death. It's biting something and the thing is dying like 10 days later. And you write about it and you kind of really lean into the grossness and the badness, you know, which is wonderful. And it is, but it is amazing how you can get people in the comments to defend to the death, the Komodo dragon as the most beautiful creature that has ever lived, you know, and have these strong, strong feelings about this thing. And it's wonderful to see, to kind of bait that and to bring that out and, and look at why people have such strong feelings about them. Or look at something like a ladybird and realize that if you think about a ladybird, you suddenly remember all of these things from your childhood, which are also the things from a lot of other people's childhoods. And I really like that kind of soft way to think about nature and science, I think, is, is, is wonderful, yeah. The other thing that occurs to me, um, thinking about your question, is if you spend time with a toddler, <laughs> you'll, you'll see them engaging in a lot of what we call the scientific process because they're trying to understand their world around them and they do that by repeating the same thing over and over to see if they'll get the same result every time, which is essentially what science is. So I, I think it, it's a very human drive to try to understand the world which sometimes we put the label science on and sometimes we don't, but it's 
it's essentially the same kind of thing of I want to understand, you know. Yeah, like um, going from your point, um, what you've raised, um, Jane, is like to me science is about curiosity and curios curiosity doesn't necessarily should be in a lab or be draped in a white lab coat. It's about us leading to ask questions to understand and also it fires up our imagination and that's how the scientific process begins. It just so happens that it's labelled by hypotheses, methods or whatever just to kind of give a bit of structure and then it leads to, but at the core of it, like when I, in the past and even talking to scientists now, I'm like, oh, tell me about how you, why did you want to do this? Like, well, I just, I had a, like, there's, there's actually a piece, it's actually in there, it's like, there was a question and I wanted to answer it. Like, why else would I be a scientist? <laughs> and that's pretty much at the core of it. Again, it's like, um, it's a really good question. Like, it's, it's wrapped up, like science, it's too often presented as one dimensional. It's very much, it's like, oh, they found this thing. But behind every sort of data point is like a multitude of stories and a multitude of questions and curiosity behind it as well. And I think with science writing, it's that sort of attempt to kind of pin down <laughs> some point of it at time. No science article will ever completely capture the multitudes. Like ours is just a time point. Like your article, there will be a sequel like to their researchers. Like it might not be written, but there will be a sequel, same with yours, about, and with anything else that we write. Like, and it's, these articles are invitation for people to kind of read a bit more beyond those confines of the word count. I also think about what the different disciplines have to teach each other. Right? Yeah, so exactly. I, what I, like you sort of say, scientists want to answer the question. What I love about science as well is that it, it's also about asking the right question, like yeah. developing the right kind of, yeah, are you asking the right question in a survey or are you designing an experiment so that yeah. it's going to test things in the right way, remembering high school science lessons. <laughs> um, but that's such a kind of wonderful thing to then bring to like an investigation of a book or to criticism or, yeah. yeah. And it's never fixed and it's never finished and it's always changing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. So um, a very common question, first thing they say is like, well, 10 years ago, and I'm like, oh, it's, it's going to be a long one in a good way because their work has been on the shoulders of other giants. If you read an academic paper, that's why the references is like 200 like authors deep because it is a string, it's like a chain. What I like to describe, it's like a chain of research. There is a small blip. It's like, because um, that's, why, that's why the introduction section always comes first in an academic paper. It's to give a context. So yeah, that's the scientific process. So Ivy, that was a really good way to finish. So thank you so much. Oh, there's oh, one no. more question. No, no, no. <laughs> Last question, but no, let me get you, sorry. science and all sorts of fields of research is you have to be careful not to shut it off from people with the jargon mm. and I think that's sometimes part of the problem and Ivy you just mentioned the, the kind of um, executive summary at the beginning of a scientific paper and I'm well I'm a scientist all right I've got <laughs> whatever that is <laughs> I'm a graduate in things that are called sciences but I look at these things and think there's a wall just been put up there because I don't know what those words mean in that context. So, yeah, so as science writers and as preparing an anthology, I guess you need to reach past that, don't you? And Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. As a past scientist, I had to unlearn a lot of things. For example, an example I really like to give is the word significant. Significant to us means seismic. It's huge. To scientists, it's statistical. So when you say significant findings in a paper, it's, it's like it's P like greater than 0 0.05. It's, it's a completely different thing. That's why, but so I have to be very careful in using the word significant in any science writing that I do because it has very different implications. That's why when you read and some, like take a look at like news articles, scientists, significant changes. Is it statistical? Is it really significant? So that's one of the things I had to completely unlearn and I actually had to be corrected because I'm, everyone had to begin somewhere as a science writer. I had to be corrected. I had an editor's like, no, I had the scientists correct me saying that. Well, sin yes, it's significant. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember. I've had this flashback to like Excel sp spreadsheets. So, but that's another, like you said, like 
getting past the jargon. That's why we, me personally, I talk very closely with the researchers. When they start talking jargon, I'm like, wait, what does that mean? So yeah, you mentioned an acronym. What does that mean? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'd love you to join me in thanking our three authors today. <laughs>